بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله Alhamdulillah. It is such a pleasure and honestly an honor to see uh, so many familiar and new faces. Thank you for being here. I know it's we took a really long hiatus um, from these sessions, but inshallah, moving forward, they will continue in the, with the monthly um, program. I was, uh, before Maghrib, I was just mentioning that, um, you know, it's been since right before Ramadan of this year that we had our last session. And if I recall, because it's been so long, that we were working on a text called The Foundations of the Spiritual Path and just kind of reading that text together. And if you've read the text or if you remember those sessions, the, um, the text is really just advice on how to establish a spiritual path and what the prerequisites are and what sort of the building blocks of having a strong spiritual foundation are. And it's it's a really fantastic text, and I um, encourage everyone to independently read it as well. Assalamu alaikum. The Foundations of the Spiritual Path by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq. And you can do a simple Google for it. There's PDF of it available. I've shared the link. Uh, it's on the YouTube, um, I think, link also for these halakas. We've, we've put that there. So there's, but, but if you need the link to the PDF, I can, I can share that as well off, off uh, line. But that is a wonderful text. And, you know, as I mentioned, the, the text is really just advice. And so I was thinking about how so much of our life is um, either taking advice, giving advice, depending on the role that we as women uh, play, we do end up um, really, this is a big part of the role of a woman, you know, and I think uh, as, as whether we're daughters or, or sisters or mothers or aunts, aunties or best friends, uh, or just, you know, members of our community, well, people may turn to us, you know, for guidance or advice or just, you know, to to share uh, things and, and seek out um, uh, opinions. And so that puts you in a position of immense responsibility, right? And, and I know it's easy to sometimes, from the heart, want to give uh, advice, but there, as I said, it's an amana, and we have to be really careful especially in this day and age where there's just so much information, so many opinions out there. And also people are interpreting things, you know, from very subjective places, whereas truth is objective, right? In our deen, truth is not subjective. Truth is not something that changes from person to person, right? There is truth and then there's falsehood. And the one who is in the position of guiding someone should operate from the position of truth, right? And if you are injecting your own opinion into what you think is something, you may actually end up causing more harm. And in my you know, work in the community, I can definitely speak on um, my own personal journey learning this lesson you know, about the importance of really making sure that I have discernment you know, that I'm not just giving advice based on what I think is right or wrong, but actually that I'm sourcing that advice from the the tradition itself. So, uh, you know, for those who don't know, one of the subjects that I teach currently is on logic, critical thinking, and debate, like public speaking, debate. I teach middle schoolers, but there's a really great text that we use, and it's called A Guide to Critical Thinking. So I wanted to just share some advice because I think, you know, this book is a really good, or the, the list that they provide is general advice on, um, on standards, on intellectual standards that we should have uh, for everything. You know, it's kind of like a checklist um, that we should implement when we're looking at information, when we're processing, when we're consuming news, uh, we're reading anything, whether it's articles on any subject or obviously from uh, you know from individuals who may experts who may have opinions whatever it is and then also on the opposite side of it when we are in a position where we're giving advice that we also maintain a standard right and that standard if we um, ascribe to it inshallah we will maintain the integrity and the objective, you know, objective of, of upholding the truth. So what are the standards that they list out? And again, these are just general intellectual standards. So they say here that 
um, remember that good thinker is a person who can discern, who knows how to weigh, you know, truth from falsehood, who can basically see these things or understand these things and and decide uh, what to believe using intellectual standards. They should have, there's some certain uh, criteria. So what are those? The first is that they um, have clarity, right? So that something is understandable and nothing is confusing. So that's the, if you're reading something and you don't know what it's saying, to try to you know, decode that on your own, right, could lead to a false interpretation. So if something is not clear for you, is there a language barrier? You know, is there a meaning in there that you're just not quite picking up? This is when, what does uh, Ardeen teach us? That if we don't know something, what are we supposed to do? Right? Ask those who don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you don't know, ask those who know. So that should be the first thing, is that if something is the ambiguous, vague, the text itself or the words were not clear, right, about their meaning, that we don't f uh, feel forced to... Uh, offer an interpretation because when we do that if you think about that um, you're putting your own ego before right upholding a standard because you know if someone asks you a question if they want if they're asking you do you know about this particular topic and you feel like you should know right and then you're kind of caught in that moment of like uh oh um, oh what, do, what does this mean and then you're reading it and you're like you're not really clear yourself about it but you feel the need to offer an explanation and then that person goes you know and, and takes it and thinks that that's you know the, the, they just take your word for it again you're you're now liable for any potential um, you know fallout from that right i mean if you think of a hadith for example if you think of a quranic ayah how dangerous it is to do that so if you're not clear you have to have the um, default of saying, I don't know, la adri, right? Imam Malik was known, rahimahullah, that that was a very common quote from him. Even though he was a giant of a scholar, he was oft, often known to say, I don't know. I don't know. So we should, you know, really be f totally comfortable admitting we don't know. And then if you seek to know, of course, uh, you know, make sure that you're pursuing clarity. You ask those who don't, who know. Um, also accuracy, like it's important. And so th this works both ways, whether you're taking information or you're the one that is dispensing. So if you're in the position of giving advice or, or instructing or teaching, make sure that you're also speaking very clearly, right? Uh, and using very clear language. So this is just one, the first standard. Then accuracy, make sure that everything you're saying is true. So citation is really important. There's a lot of information that we could be taking in. You see emails, uh, if you're on different threads on WhatsApp or Telegram or whatever people are using, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, there's a lot of memes, there's a lot of images created. People are always sharing data or what we think is data. And then sometimes there's no sourcing right? And if you're, you know, in a position where you're vulnerable and you're in a weak state and then you read something that seems to bolster you, you know, gives you a sense of confidence, you know, maybe, um, maybe there's no accuracy to it. Maybe it's just one person's opinion. But if you take that and you go home and now you have a discussion with a family member or an argument or something that leads to something else or you, whatever it, it is, you start using that particular fact or whatever you th you read to um, to defend a position, then, you know, without doing your vetting, right, without making sure is this accurate, is there a source, that's the one number one standard. What is the source of this information? So always asking for sourcing, right? Uh, and again, when you're speaking as well, if you're giving advice, um, don't just give opinion, always provide citation. I read this in this book or this scholar said this, Try to always do that. And if you don't remember, then, you know, be cautious of what you share just from memory, because, again, it could lead to uh, a false understanding or just misguidance on, on whatever the issue is. So accuracy, precision, right? Be really uh, specific to the problem. Sometimes in our advice, and this is, I think, um, when we overdo it, you know, we can actually cause a lot of harm if we're offering unsolicited advice, right? So someone's asking about one thing and now we're like, we're, we're now on a soapbox. And sometimes the nafs likes the attention, right? The nafs likes to be um, 
called into these, you know, roles that I am the advisee, you know, someone's coming to me for advice. So I, I it kind of makes, you know, it fluffs up a little bit. So if you start to, if they ask you on one topic and all of a sudden you're, you know, talking about every aspect of their life or just general advice and just, you know, overdoing it, unsolicited advice. Now, is it really for their benefit or is it that you like the power of the position you're in, right? So you have to always question the limits of what you're doing, right? Am I being precise? Am I on topic? Or am I just using this as a means of, you know, feeling good about my own self or feeling, you know, whatever. So there's all of this, again, just certain standards we have to maintain. So clarity, accuracy, precision, relevance. And this is similar, right? If we're being specific to the topic, are we also being relevant? Because sometimes, for example, modern issues, right, necessitate a modern perspective. If you're going to bring outdated advice, you know, let's say you're having issues in your relationship and then you're bringing um, and sometimes generationally we see this right there's generational gaps so people who are older sometimes give advice that's just not no longer relevant parenting how many awful takes do people have when it comes to parenting because they're totally speaking about a different era a different time a different generation a different context so today's parenting is not going to look like uh, 10 years ago even, let alone 30 years ago, let alone 40 years ago, right? So the further back we go, the less relevant we are. So relevance is really important, you know, in terms of what am I saying? Is it actually, you know, does it apply? Depth. Depth would be the fifth one. If it's superficial and shallow, then it is performative. Because if someone's coming to you, right, the Prophet ﷺ said, الدين النسيحة. Right? Qalaman, like to who? And then he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? First, that you, and what is nasiha? Nasiha is often translated as sincerity or sincere goodwill or advice. But the first uh, component of being a person who's in this position of wishing goodwill and, you know, doing good is to have that sincerity and really come from the heart. So when you're giving advice, if it's, again, you're not really thinking about it, it's like mindless just, you know, stuff coming out of your mouth. You, you read this or you read that, but you're not absorb or really absorbing the person's dilemma, really thinking about it, contemplating it, trying to look at the situation from all angles, right? This is what you've all heard me say this before, but like an emotionally intelligent way of approaching any topic is to look at it holistically, right? Like all angles of that problem. But if you're like, for example, your friend comes to, comes to you and I'm speaking to women mostly, but it could be reversed and they have a complaint about their husband, right? If you're only, if your bias is, well, he has to be wrong because you're my best friend. I love you. You're so sweet. You're so kind. You could do no harm. You're not giving a holistic view of the potential issue. You could actually add fuel to the fire, right? What? He said that to you? What a jerk. I can't believe he said it. You haven't even heard his side. But you think you're being a good friend, right? You think you're being supportive to your friend. This is actually very dangerous. Because what if there's a whole other side that she not by manipulation or, or at all, but she's vulnerable. She wants support. She needs support. She's just omitting <laughs> the other angle of the story completely, right? And she's making herself, you know, the victim in the situation. But maybe if you heard his side, you would be like, oh, I didn't know that, you know? So we want to be very careful when we're, to not give like knee-jerk answers when we're giving advice or just like operating. There, there shouldn't be a reaction, Right? It should be to have some depth to it. And depth requires, let me you know, kind of think about it a little, little bit or, or let me you know, consider all the other you know, potential um, angles of the situation and then try to see it. And then, and then you offer that. And that also leads to the next one, which is breadth. You know, B-R-E-A-D-T-H, not breadth, <laughs> but the breadth of, breadth of something, right? Which is, again, 
looking at all sides uh, of, of it. So deep depth is really like your heart where you are. You want to truly help them. Breath is being able to see all sides. So they kind of are interconnected. Um, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. We're on the sixth one. There's three more. So the seventh one is logic. Now this is where we get a little um, in, in, in the gray because you know, people have different definitions of what is logical and what's illogical. And a lot of that comes down to the way that we think. And if you think a certain way, then that makes sense for you. And you think it's logical, but maybe it's not. So we have to go back to, you know, the basics of what is logic and how do you become a thinker that is objective, right? And that's where our dean is actually, it really can help you because what that does when you become a person that is fully committed to upholding the truth, right? You're not concerned with opinion because it's already established, right? The truth is established by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you don't need to worry about opinion in that case. And so logic uh, is, 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 does it align with the truth? If it doesn't align with the truth, even if it makes sense to me, right? If there's a, if it's contradicting anything uh, said by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then it's even if it makes sense to me that it's not in line with what we would uphold as uh, a standard of truth and logic. So reasonability, all of those things, right? Um, so that's that's really important. And then significance, right? Um, when you're, and again, it's this is a two-way process, right? Because intellectual standards is how we're reading things, but also how we're communicating. So when you're, you know, reading things, you should take in, uh, things that are significant. And this is just, I mean, this is just a general nasiha, but I think we really need to be cautious about the consumption of information because it's just, we're like in the buffet of buffets of information in the information age. There's just too much out there. And if you find yourself going deep down in rabbit holes that are just not worth your time at all, right? Then you're, you're um, wasting precious minutes and, and seconds, but also brain cells, like just, you know, really have a higher standard of what you're going to consume. Just like we're wary of, uh, of what we drink and eat, right? Allah's father calls us to have the highest, the most purest food and drink. Also the information that we consume. So just look at, you know, who are you reading? Whose uh, social media pages are you following? What books do you you know, download onto your Kindle or whatever, you know, service that you have. What shows are you watching? Like, I feel like, especially, you know, in the past few years, but certainly in the past year with everything that's happened um, with Gaza and all of the scandals that have come out of, you know, the media and Hollywood, I hope to God and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we as Muslims have really just kind of stepped back and say, we're no longer going to participate and we're not we're no longer going to be mindless consumers of junk media because we've been totally complicit in supporting really degenerate uh you know industries if you look at hollywood and entertainment industry they promote degeneracy and by consuming the music and the film and the netflix and the garbage that they put out there it's supply and demand, right? We're, we're actually complicit in that. So we have to hold ourselves accountable. And that's where, you know, just really remem remembering we're, we have moral uh, agency. We, Allah will hold us accountable. You know, and I, I was reading uh, was from Surah Al-Baqarah. I'll read it here because it's just something, sometimes verses just grab a hold of you. You know, you may subhanAllah read them time and time again, but then sometimes they just kind of startle you. But there's something we have to think about. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 284, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وإن تبدو ما في أنفسكم أو تخفوه يحاسبكم به به الله فيغفر لمن يشاء ويعذب من يشاء والله على كل شيء قدير to Allah alone belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on earth. Whether you reveal what is in your hearts or conceal it, Allah will 
call you to account for it. He forgives whoever he wills and punishes whoever he wills. And Allah is most capable of everything. So, I mean, that's just really important because sometimes, you know, we do things thinking it's just my little vice. No one else knows about it. You know, I have this little weakness. I can't help it. I love to watch, you know, whatever, Housewives of New York, binge watch, you know, these shows, whatever it is. And then uh, you forget that that's, you know, again, those are hours and uh, it's a non-renewable resource time. You know, we, we get a certain allotment of time. We can't increase that, you know, or decrease it. It's fixed. Every one of us has, our days are numbered, our hours are numbered. So the fact that we waste it and we're all guilty of these things, but we should do better. So significance is just in general is it worth your time, whatever it is you're consuming? And then also, likewise, you know, sometimes people ask you things that are a waste of your time, and you shouldn't participate in those things, you know? Don't get caught up in conversations that are just pointless, idle talk. So just have a standard, you know? Like, I'm not going to go and talk uh, and debate whether or not, you know, this celebrity is better than that celebrity. Like, what? Who cares? It's not, it's not worth my time. So, you know, raising the bar in what we accept as worth, you know, uh, the time that we give to people or conversations. So it works in, again, both scenarios. And then fairness, that's also really important because bias is so subtle. A lot of people were just not aware of how much bias we actually have. And sometimes because of the way we were raised, you know, our cultures, right? We have certain cultural biases. We have, uh, you know, maybe gender bias. We have a lot of different things that could uh, affect the way that we look at a situation or look at, look at information. But we also always want to remember back to Allah has already established what is fair. Am I in alignment with that, right? Or am I just, uh, do I have my own definition? Um, and then, you know, really working on trying to, again, align yourself. So these are just the general standards that, intellectual standards that I think we all need to consider. And I, I appreciated the list. And so, you know, when I, when I juxtapose a list like this, and then I look at um, a text like this, which is Imam al-Ghazali's Book of Councils, right? This is a, the text that I hope to continue to read uh, during these sessions. Um, then it's like, subhanAllah, it just all kind of makes sense because you can see that the scholars and obviously the awliya, the righteous, those who are on the path, they understand all of this and even more. This is just for us to kind of at least get to some standard, you know. But these people, this is they live this reality. They, they didn't waste their time. They looked at everything with this, with this critical analysis and they questioned things with reason, they were always doing what we're talking about, intellectualizing. And uh, I think we've lost that. You know, we're, we're, this is the crisis of our era, is that our standards have gone so low. And there's a reason for that. It's by design. You know, we're, we need to really understand that there are people in certain positions who, who know, who understand human nature, and they know if they preoccupy us with food and drink and entertainment, and you know certain luxuries that we are afforded that what can happen is we start to neglect this incredible thing that we can do as human beings that no other creation can do which is think and reflect and contemplate i mean what an incredible gift right the quwwat al aqliya it's an incredible gift that allah has given us animals are instinctual you know, the jinn are share in, the, in that they can also discern. But from all the other creations, all the other living uh, things, we are the only ones who can actually rationalize and use the gifts and faculties we've been given to arrive at conclusions that will then help us to know our creator. But the demonic uh, realm and humans who belong to that realm would love nothing more than to prevent us from doing that. So, because we're, we're a danger to their aims, right? They have an aim. They love dunya. They want to live here forever um, and enjoy this, like, as if it's their jannah. 
and we stand in their way. You know, our uh, standards, for example, just with with everything. You know, we have um, whether it's with banking and money and the financial responsibility or food and drink. There's a lot of standards that we not just Muslims, but people of faith um, require. So to get us out of the way makes it easier for them to just do whatever they want, right? So they don't want us to be critical thinkers. They don't want us to question things. They don't want us to actually use our minds. And that's why they busy us with everything else. But the people of, of true taqwa, of, of our path, who were free of these, uh, I mean, they, they, didn't, they didn't have to deal with the things that we're dealing with today. They understood. And so... Alhamdulillah, I wanted to you know, just share the first council and then we can break it up for any Q&A. But I'll just uh, read the introduction because the translation says here, the title of this tre treatise by Imam Abu Hamid, Muhammad al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, is Al-Mawa'id fil Hadith al-Qudsiyah, or Councils from Divine Narrations. It is a collection of 38 hadith likely intended to fulfill the purpose of a statement attributed to the Prophet ﷺ about the merits of collecting 40 hadith. Whosoever from my community preserves 40 hadith regarding religious matters, Allah will raise him on the day of resurrection among those who, un who with understanding and the scholars. Uh, and then Abu Darda, he had a variation to that that said, that the Prophet also said, and I will be an intercessor and a witness for him. So this hadith encourages you know, people to um, create a, or a, a, a compilation, right? And that's what Imam al-Ghazali did here. And so some of these hadith are attributed to hadith Qudsi, right, which were, um, which uh, are direct, uh, um, you know, reports um, from the Prophet Sallallahu but they're attributed on the authority of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and there's uh, full explanations on how the um, some of these hadith are categorized and how uh, you know the, the in the in this particular book that the, there's different categories. So the first is that they are based on direct hadith Qudsi. Others are just interpretations of certain uh, advice or words of the Prophet Sallallahu that he may have said, and then. Um, Others are not considered as part of hadith, qudsi, or otherwise, through their meaning and message, though their meaning and message are certainly derived from authentic hadith. So it's almost like uh, paraphrasing, but they're all linked back to the Prophet So it's just a really uh, wonderful text. But the first one, inshallah, I thought for us, just to again, you know, activate the, this wonderful intellect that we've been given and to kind of contemplate and think deeply on meanings, um, inshallah, I, I think will be a, a really wonderful um, start to these sessions. So I'll read Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, most gracious, the most merciful. Praise belongs to Allah for a reminder for the worshippers, a bolstering for the righteous from the Muslims and their worship. Benedictions upon the bearer of the pure creed and favor upon his family, his companions and their families and upon whom follows them in beautification, as well as the scholars of the community in every era. In the Book of Councils is a beautiful benefit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us by it. The first council. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Son of Adam, I am astonished by the one who is certain of death, yet he is joyous. I am astonished by the one who is certain of the accounting, yet he gathers wealth. I am astonished by the one who is certain of the grave, yet he laughs. I am astonished by the one who is certain of the hereafter, yet he rests. I am astonished by the one who is certain of the world and its termination, yet he is at ease with it. I am astonished by the one who is knowledgeable on the tongue, yet he is ignorant in the heart. I am astonished by the one who purifies himself with water, yet he is not pure of heart. I am astonished by the one who is preoccupied with the flaws of others, yet he is heedless of his own flaws. By the one who knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beholds him, yet sins, by the one who knows that he dies alone, enters the grave alone, and is held to account alone, yet heeds other people. 
There is no God except me, truly, and Muhammad is my slave and emissary. Okay, so that's the first counsel. So again, these are hadith qudsi. So Allah is communicating to us that, that he is astonished by those of us who know death is imminent, but we are joyous. And what does that mean? Like, how do we interpret something like that? Right? Does that mean like we can never be joyful? What does it mean to be joyful versus joyous? Like if we're critically thinking of that. Okay. Yeah, consuming. Do sure. Good. Those are great. Great. If we look at the words themselves, like the structure of the word, right? Joyful and joyous, right? Which one seems to suggest more permanence? Joyous, right? Joyful, you can be, you can have a joyful moment, right? We've all experienced joy, right? You see someone after a really long time, your heart f fills with like, you know, joy. Um, but joy is suggests like you're in a state, like you're always, you know, joy, joy, joyful, joyous. That means that when are you actually, you know, thinking about the uh, the inevitable, right? Because that should actually put you in a different state, right? So yes, if you're as Mari was saying, living a jet set life, you're constantly escaping, right? Escapism, as they call it this life of entertainment, fast life, right? The life of fast cars, vacations, eating out all the time, um, just constantly running from the akhira toward dunya, right? And seeking fun in everything you do. It's like, it's not worth your time unless it's fun. And we may know, like, for example, children, that's kind of standard, right? Children are always looking for fun and even are you know, teens and as, you know, kind of coming out of childhood, you still want to hold on to, you know, uh, that that becomes your criteria for doing something, right? Is it fun? But then you get to a certain point where life hits you, you become more mature, you realize like life isn't always fun and games, and I have to actually accept that there's going to be some low points. So that kind of, you know, tempers the excitement, excitability of the, of the childlike spirit within us, right? That sanguine temperament we have. And so we start to get a little bit more serious and the sobering truth of dunya or life comes in. So a person who's joyous is just not capable of sustaining uh, or they're, they're running from themselves, right? They're running from reality and truth because they are terrified. You know, they're terrified of, of uh, loss. They're terrified of their own, you know, demise. They're terrified of the other, of things that they don't know and see. So they want to hold on to what's real and tangible, right? So it's, if it's, if I can see it and it's real, then then I want it. I want it more. But ideas like you know the akhira, they just they don't really seem to hold much. So that's the difference there, right? I'm astonished by the one who is certain of death. Like all of us know we're, we live and we die. It's like something you learn very young. But if you're joyous, that means that you're you're just not uh, accepting exactly that that death is going to seize you at any minute, and that. Awareness is what should, that's why the Prophet said, you know, he told us, if you knew what I knew, you would laugh little and weep much. Because the awareness that death is imminent and it could seize us at any moment should put you in a more, you know, kind of upright state. That doesn't mean you can't experience joy in moments. It means that you take yourself very seriously you take your time very seriously. You take your objectives and mission in life very seriously. You're not frivolous. It's the frivolity that has, you know, spread so much now that people, uh, adults are behaving like children, you know, and they are. Look at the dress of some adults. You're like, what? We've lost complete sense of decency and decorum and what's appropriate. Uh, there be, you know, they're, they're, behaving like children. I mean, there's just a lot of frivolity in our cultures. Um, and so, mm -hmm. yes.
Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. No, that's a beautiful reflection that death in and of itself is not something that we should fear, but it's rather that it's the cessation. It's the end of the opportunity, right, to do good. And if you have that paradigm shift, then you have a different relationship with life, right? Because you realize that every moment is actually important because every moment Allah is holding me accountable for and I'm going to start taking myself a little bit more seriously. Again, that doesn't mean you can't have moments of joy and smile and laugh and find things funny. Um, do that, but be a person who takes life seriously. So that's the first one. And then, you know, I'm astonished by the one who is certain of the accounting, yet he gathers wealth. This one is also so important because we are like every penny, every dollar that we accrue, you know, if we're not feeling the weight of it, right, especially when we are in, for the first time maybe in history, we have so much uh, of a world view that others before us just didn't have about the way that other people live. Like we see, com you know, com poverty that, that I think most of us couldn't even fathom ever experiencing, but we can witness it, right? So when you watch what's happening, obviously, in Gaza and other parts of the world, I mean, genocide unfolding, and these people are literally, they have nothing, literally nothing. Everything's been obliterated. And then you think about your own pursuit of wealth, forgetting that every single atom, right, of, of material things that we have, the wealth, money, clothing, should kind of feel like a crushing weight on us. Like it should, it should feel that way. I go into my closet all the time and I'm like, oh my God, astaghfirullah. Like I, I, I need to purge, I need to purge. We've, alhamdulillah, we moved, you know, not too long ago and we've been lightening the garage and it is so awesome to see the space, like the, I can see the floor. <laughs> I'm like, thank Allah, I just want to see more of the, the floor of the garage. Like, get rid of these boxes, let's just go, give them away. Well, you don't need this, give them away. It's such a great feeling because the weight of uh, having so many things that we don't use, it's just like I said, it crushes you if you really understand that all of this is going to come back on you. So instead of keep pursuing the dunya and adding more, don't forget the accountant knows you know, what is, uh, like, you know, I mean, he, and we're going to be held accountable. So, again, the words, I think, if we, you know, really pay attention, they, they hold so much meaning. I am astonished by the one who is certain of the grave, yet he laughs. So this is similar to what we talked about, right? Like, again, it doesn't mean we can't laugh, but it just means you don't take life in jest. You take life seriously because the death is imminent. I am astonished by the one who is certain of the hereafter, yet he rests. So, you know... This dunya is the place of work. That's what, you know, Mubarak was saying. Like your deeds. Like you, you, we need to be hustling in this life for our akhirah. So if, that doesn't mean we don't take repose. Of course, we're human beings. We have needs. We need to sleep. We need to rest. But we're talking about good deeds. Like if you're not hustling for good deeds some way or another, trying to figure out where can I maximize the good deeds, you know? My prayers, alhamdulillah, okay, I'm doing my prayers on time, good, checklist, right? And the, the objective is that there's growth. Because if it's like the same status quo for, you know, one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, six years, and you haven't really evolved, that's a problem. So the objective is I need to be uh, doing more. So where am I, in my good deeds, Where where do I see growth? For some people, maybe they're more charitable. Maybe their prayers are the same, but their charity has increased. For others, maybe it's their prayers or their Qur'an or their du'as or their, you know, community service or their khidmah to their family. But you should see growth, right? So the the rest is, is talking about, like, you know, just not really even factoring in, you know, that, that we should be... Uh, always evolving, but rather getting stagnant, which is very normal when you're so tired from pursuing dunya that you don't have time to care about your akhira. And that's where a lot of us are, right? We're so tired from work and taking care of the kids and cooking and cleaning that it's like, well, I'm just too tired. I can't do more than that. But that's where you, it's an inversion. You're, you've got your priorities totally upside down. The, what, the fatigue that you should feel not in a, in a good way, Right? It's kind of like when you have a really good workout, right? Your muscles are sore, but you will never regret that 
Nobody regrets having a really good workout, right? Yeah, it feels uncomfortable, but you're like, I feel so accomplished. And you know that your body is enjoying that because, you know, it's like you're, you put it to the test. The cells are so happy. It's detoxing. There's all this great stuff happening. Inflammation's going down. So, yeah, you might feel, you know, the fatigue, but it's still an enjoyable thing. Same when you're restless for the sake of Allah. That's why the Prophet said when he was up in the middle of the night and Aisha, Allah, his wife, was like, your legs are swollen. You know, what was his answer? Should I not be a grateful servant? He took delight in feeling the effects of his worship, even though physically it was, you know, there, there was a, a, a reaction to that, but he obviously was in a, in a state of gratitude to Allah. So resting is speaking about, you know, not really doing enough deeds here. I'm astonished by the one who is certain of the world and its termination, yet he is at ease with it. You know, like all this is going to come to an end. All of it. It's all going to disappear before our eyes. I mean, we won't be here to witness the disappearance of it, but it will be gone. And, uh, you know, there's, that's why it's, it's uh, I think, important to study history or visit, like, sites, you know, if you've ever been to, like, historical sites, and you just stand there and you're like, like, I remember many years ago when I went to Jordan, and we went to Petra, you know, you just stand there and you're like, this was a civilization, this was a city built into the mountains, these, they're gone, you know, or the pyramids, wherever you go, you just see, like, the remnants of the people there, they're gone. And then the, a really good thought is to think about, yeah, okay, where we are now, some of us are in midlife, right? Um, you know, in 50 years or less, we will be gone and we will be forgotten. Yeah, it's, three generations, actually. Yeah, three generations, there you go. So in three, after you die, right? Or no. Well, your grandkids will remember you and mm -hmm. you that's true. That's true. That's actually a very good. Absolutely. No, it's a very good reminder. Sobering and sad, but it's true because you think of yourself like my was. Yeah, I mean, I'll generally say all of my previous, you know, it, it, when I remember, but that's not a that's not an everyday dua. My grandparents, my parents, you're right. So three generations. There you go. We'll be forgotten. So no matter how important you think you are, it's all going to come to an end. But we shouldn't be, um, you know, at ease with that. We should think about that, especially for our children moving forward and thinking about what their children are going to experience, you know. So just reflecting on these things. I'm astonished by the one who is knowledgeable on the tongue, yet he is ignorant in the heart. That's actually very deep, huh? Yeah. Yeah. What, what do we make of that one? All right. Stop for a long Absolutely. The iman is not there. Yeah. Iman is not there. We're just saying it. Exactly. Empty words or words that have not reached the heart, you know. They're on the tongue. So you might have, you know, read things, heard things. So you sound very convincing. But in your heart of hearts, there's nothing there. You're not acting on it, right? In the world, what saves our soul. You know, it doesn't matter what you're saying. Exactly. Exactly. This is all. That's why the... The performance, you know, that, that we give, um, I mean, then this is what the nafs does. It puts such a emphasis on the outward appearance and how we appear to others and our likability. Women were very susceptible to this too, right? Being people pleasers. So we're always thinking about the outward reality or, or perception instead of the inward. And that's, again, the, the lifelong struggle. So yeah, to have knowledge on the tongue, but ignorant in the heart. I'm astonished by the one who purifies himself with water, yet he is not pure of heart. This is uh, honestly also some to think about. People who, you know, they make wudu, they make make ghusl, but their hearts are filled with disease. So again, we're stuck on that ritualistic, we're stuck on the outward. But then we don't think about purifying the heart. The heart has to be purified. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Fiqh and tasawf absolutely go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Because if you're outwardly focused and you're not working, that's what we just talked about. You've become, it's uh, the gateway to nifaq because you're just performing and vice versa. You know, if you're inwardly, you know, thinking that you're, you know, this illuminated person, but you're abandoning sharia, you're abandoning the rules, then you're writing your own deen. 
that's not Islam. Islam has to go through the proper source, right? Which is the book of Allah and the son of the Prophet So if you're in those, you know, within those boundaries and then simultaneously aware of your own um, fallibility, then you will spend the more time again preoccupied with yourself, which is the next, you know, reflection. I'm astonished by the one who is preoccupied with the flaws of others, yet he is heedless of his own flaws. And this is, I think, again, just a good exercise to catch yourself, um, you know, whenever, to, to see the reality of the nafs is whenever uh, negative vices or, you know, poor qualities or traits or characteristics are being described, whether it's, you know, a general kind of, uh, if you're watching something, you're reading something, but it's talking about bad habits, bad qualities. If your mind veers off and you start to think of other people who have those qualities, right? That's what we're talking about. Because it's the nafs doesn't want you to come into reality of your own uh, flaws. So it will immediately direct you to other people. So you start thinking, oh yeah, you know, for example, you know, what's the buzzword now? The buzzword that everybody knows and everybody diagnoses is narcissist, right? He's such a narcissist. She's such a narcissist. And we're throwing out all these labels on other people. Every one of us is a narcissist, believe it or not. That is literally the quality of the, the nafs is we are narcissistic. The nafs will center itself. The nafs sees the world through its lens. We're all narcissists at the end of the day to different degrees. Some are more than others. That's the nafs, right? But to think that they have that, I don't have that is prime time, like, you know, delusion of the nafs. So, uh, in, in, Carl Jung, Dr. Carl Jung, yeah, Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. I would ask him for this. Yeah. We have shadows in our shadow self, absolutely. He Which is the same. Very yeah. Nice, uh, conversation about shadows yes. Our absolutely. Yeah. No, it's a, it's it's and they you know they use psychology psychological terms or like their own sort of you know terminology to try to distance themselves from spiritual language, but the shadow self is really the ego or the nafs. Uh, this, these are all ancient like, concepts, universal to many traditions that we have, you know, the social and the personal like side. And so anyway, but but to be completely preoccupied with other people and, and forget that you yourself are susceptible to all these diseases is another one of his many, many tricks, you know, because now you're not even working on yourself. And then um, the, the ending of this beautiful counsel is by the one who knows that Allah subhanahu uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala beholds him yet sins by the one who knows that he dies alone enters the grave alone and is held to account alone yet heeds other people that's powerful right we're all going to die alone so if we're heeding other people that means we're putting other people always before allah right we'd we'd rather you know people please Rather like, oh, I can't say this, I can't do that because, you know, I don't want to be ousted. I don't want to be ostracized from the group. I don't want people not to like me. I, don't, I want to be included. So we're willing to compromise our principles, our faith for the, you know, but not realizing that none, they're not going to benefit us. None of them are going to go with us. We will face God alone. So all of that was for naught, right? It's, right? Um, but again, wake up. There is no God except me, truly, and Muhammad is my slave and emissary. So this was the first council. Again, a lot to think about. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we, if we just start to elevate our standard, you know, of what we're going to, how we're going to really be in this world, start to, you know, engage with the world and people, in this way where it's like we're, we are rational, we're rationalizing because that's what we're meant to do. That's why we were brought onto this world is not to just be passive consumers, not to just eat and drink and sleep and, you know, have relations and, you know, just indulge in every nafs. We were designed to do that on a need basis. But what we're really created to do is to rationalize so that we can come to an understanding of our creator. And we have because we're in the, you know, 
and at times we've we're totally inverted. Humanity's inverted. We're rationalizing very little. People like how many times do you hear? I don't, I don't have time to think about that. What? I don't want to think about that. It's too much. Oh my god, I can't. I'm just too tired. I don't want to think about it. Well, if you don't want to think about it, what do you want to do instead? Right? Give me that pint of ice cream. Turn on the TV. Numb yourself, exactly. So we're very indulging in all of the other aspects of our creation, but those were created to give us temporary relief and sustain us, but not to define us, right? What defines us is our intellectual capacity. So we have to restore that. And that's, you know, we're the deen of ilm, uh, we're the deen of knowledge, we're the people of knowledge, right? Muslims are supposed to be the people of, of knowledge. Uh, and so we have to restore that first within ourselves. And the way to do that is just start to raise the bar, you know, and then to, to pause when we're reading and think about things and analyze it and try to, you know, see things from a deeper perspective, inshallah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sure. So... Right. To me, something might be very clear, but to someone else, they may see it totally differently. And right. People see logic through the lens of, well, I would never do that. Right. So I, that's unacceptable. Or, oh, I do that too. Right. It's okay. You ask me to do that. And it's like, well, but you're not my standard. Right. Exactly. And I'm like, who, like, how can we, especially to our kids, how do we explain that to us? Sure. No, that's, I mean, you, I think you just explained it that logic, if it's, um, if it comes through like the lens of the individual and it's their own definition, that's not lo logic, right? Logic, first of all, the definition of logic is the art uh, and science of reasoning and reasoning well. So when you put it in those terms, right, how do you reason well? Then you have to figure out, well, by which standard or metric are you reasoning well, right? Because if you're a scientist, you know, you have a certain criteria. For believers, our reasoning is aligned with haq, with what does it fall in, in within the boundaries of uh, what is in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. That is logic. Anything outside of that is opinion. So it doesn't fall, and it doesn't fit the criteria, right? So once you establish that that's the type of logic we're talking about, I'm not talking about like, you know, like I said, a, a scientist's definition of logic or a mathematician's necessarily definition of logic. Um, in fact, I think it was um, Sayyidina Ali who said, uh, uh, عنه, he said that if our deen was based on logic, we would mess, wipe the bottom of our feet, right? Uh, not the top of our feet. Because to say that, you know, the mind will tell you, well, doesn't it make more sense that we wipe the bottom of our feet for when we, uh, you know, do wudu or tayammum? Wouldn't that make more sense? But we are following a criteria that was set forth by Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're the ones who define the logic for us. And if the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, wipe the top of the foot, right, then that's the logical thing to do. You get it? So the, they are the ones who define it for us. And outside of that, it's personal opinion. And it's very important that we can humble ourselves and know that if we, if we convince ourselves of something that goes against what Allah has decreed or what Allah has made clear or what the Prophet ﷺ has put forth, then we are actually outside of reasoning. We're now in the realm of nafs and, you know, and a demonic inclination, whispering, because it's opposing Allah and His Messenger, right? So we convince ourselves that, that makes sense or it's true or, or that it doesn't quite click for me. Well, yeah, that's for you. That's... Your, your own brain is deluding you. But if it's Allah and His Messenger said it, it's haq, it's uncontestable. You can't, you can't uh, question it because they establish what truth is. And if you don't have a standard or a definition of, of truth or a, you know, like a, a criterion for what is truth, then it becomes subjective, right? And this is the age we're in now where everybody... Uh, we're postmodernists anyway, want to say that truth is subjective. You know, you have your truth, I have my truth, and then we get in the realm of insanity, 
which is what we're seeing now. It's like people have gone mad because they can't agree on a single truth. For us, the truth is what Allah says and what his messenger says, sallallahu alayhi wa So that's it. And that's the the test, you know, the, the litmus test if something is logical, is it in accordance with Allah and his messenger? If you're outside of that, you're illogical. Bas. I hope that's clear. <laughs> yes. Right. So maybe they might not take things as serious. I mean, you sure. don't want to like crack down on them. No, <laughs> take it serious, right? right? Because we worry for them. Sure. No, it's a great uh, question about how to, you know, um, instruct and gently remind, uh, especially when youth or teens, you know, they get a little crafty and they try to, you know, finagle their way out of things or find loopholes and, you know, and, and they do that and that's totally enough. Um, but I think, you know, just reminding them that you, you know, that that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has other, you know, there's plenty of verses that you can point out that actually not contradict anything, but there's a balance, right? That, you know, in the man of niyat, everything's by intention. So if you think you're going to, you know, purposefully miss something and then try to, you know, um, what is the, the word, uh, try to not hack the system, but like, you know, cheat the system, you know, and try to like, think like, oh, I can just, you know, retroactively apply this to that. You can't do that. That's not how it works. You know, he's looking at, um, the heart, the state of the heart. So, but I think it's more important to teach children how to think logically and critically first, you know, instead of, uh, using these tools to try to, um, correct them when they're wrong. I think it's a much more effective uh, strategy to just teach them as a way of instructing. Like, let's look at what is logical and critical thinking in Islam. Let's talk about that as a topic, right, first. And then when they, um, you know, have a logical fallacy or try to, you know, use some sort of crafty way, you can then redirect them to, you know, well, that's not really falling in line with, you know, what we talked about. But, it, to you know, I, I feel like it, we need to teach children how to think better and how to also be sincere, you know, and how to know that Allah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's really about the heart and that's the most important. That's what he says, that nothing will benefit us more than the qalbun salim that we present, you know, so we can try to get, you know, uh, you know, tr try to be all uh, smart and, and whatever, witty and conniving, but none of that is going to, <laughs> like Allah can, obviously knows what's in our hearts and you can't outsmart Allah so why would you even attempt to do that how about we just try to be sincere so if you are tired you're missing your prayers because of you know some legitimate reason or you missed your prayer then maybe you should you know uh, appeal to his toba and forgiveness instead of trying to you know absolve yourself of any accountability by using this very flawed logic, you know, don't do that. Just go return to Allah and say, you know what, Allah, I'm weak. Um, I, I made a mistake. Please help me, you know, guide me, make me better, but try to, you know, help them understand that their whole, um, approach is just, is, is very nafsi because they're trying to, you know, get something like hack something. And that's just not how it works with our creator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. On parenting, yeah. And one of the kids asked, like, well, is it okay if I do everything I want to and then I make over for it and I go for my side or something? And he said that's considered premeditated sinning. Yeah. And you can't do that. Exactly. That's a <laughs> good answer. So yeah. You know, like, the, a lot of the elders in our, like, I remember, right, they would, they would watch everything, you know, do whatever, and then they would be like, oh, when I go to Yep. And then I'll purify myself and then I'll never watch TV again. Totally. And I'll see like women, you know, dressed a certain way and stuff. And even as a kid, I remember thinking, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, exactly. You can do all these things and then go purify yourself and then, oh, you're going to be like a fresh baby. You're gonna be yeah. Fresh. And then you'll just come back when you're 90 and then die. But you can't even enjoy high when you're 
Yeah, no, those are what we call like the traps of, you know, the nafs. Like Iblis and the nafs are both always setting us up to fall into these you know, traps where we think like we can, like I said, find a loophole or finagle our way out of rules and try to, you know, find a way out of these things. But Allah obviously knows one's intention. So I like that phrasing of, yeah, premeditated sinning is not acceptable and it's not going to fly. At the end of the day, like I said, it all comes down to intention, right? So... Alhamdulillah. We will, inshallah, go ahead and wrap up because it's Aisha, so we'll do a closing dua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Jazakumullah khairan, everybody. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Mawla asr, illa l-insana lafi khusr. Illa l-ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa dawasu bil-haqi wa dawasu bil-sabr. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilahi illa anta nastaghfiruk wa la tubu ilayk. Allahumma salam wa salam wa barak ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa salam wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa salam taslim wa kabira. Alhamdulillah. I mean, Jazakallah khairan, everybody, inshallah, will continue next uh, month with more councils. Um, I look forward to having you all. Barakallah fikum.